All right. Uh, welcome to another episode of Hagley History Hangout, where we interview researchers on their new projects and books uh, that are related to the broader collecting mission of the Hagley Museum and Library. This week, I am speaking with Dr. Jennifer Kaufman Bueller about her new book, Open Plan, A Design History of the American Office. So uh, Dr. Kaufman Bueller, and I, I should have asked you this before I pressed the recording button. Uh, am I pronouncing your, your name properly? Yes, yes, you are. Great, great. Um, can you tell us a little bit, uh, give us an overview of the book before we get into it? Uh, yeah, before we get into the rest of today's questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I'm a design historian, um, and this book is um, a history of this concept of the open plan office, um, right? And this idea of the open plan, uh, specifically in America, um, became a really dominant office design um, process or concept in, you know, really in the, the latter part of the 20th century. Um, and it entered the office with a whole bunch of hopes and expectations and ideals for how it would transform the workplace and transform work and improve work in all of these ways. So it, 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 it had a lot, there was a lot of idealism that was under the hood of, of the open plan. And so my book was an attempt to excavate some of that idealism to understand what those ideals were and what was motivating those ideals, where those came out of, what, what ideas about the workplace they represented, um, but also, and, and perhaps I think more critically, to think about the problems that happened when the open plan, um, you know, became a, such a dominant uh, office design concept. And I'm, I was really interested in thinking about the open plan um, as it was lived um, by organizations and sort of the challenges that organizations have, um, but also through the lens of workers and, and different different types of workers, workers of different classes and in and, and different in different positions who had very, very different experiences of this of this new kind of environment. Um, so so I, I my book is organized thematically. I have um, I sort of take some of the major sort of issues or problems uh, related to the open plan and sort of, you know, take them to piece by piece. Um, so I look at issues of hierarchy um, and status and sort of how the open plan was imagined as this very egalitarian um, office design concept um, and how actually, in fact, it ended up reproducing many of the hierarchies it, it was created to, to um, uh, a bend. Um, you know, I, I look at the issue of change and how the open plan um, hoped to make it really easy for change to happen, to transform the workplace at a moment's notice. Um, and, and of course, all the ways in which that also did not quite live up to how architects and designers imagined, imagined change might operate in this open plan environment. Um, I look at the way communication was conceptualized. So how the, the advocates of the open plan imagined this as a tool for facilitating communication and encouraging communication. Um, and how that was often in tension with what workers thought of as good communication and also with their ideas of privacy and how privacy was sort of um, being re reconceptualized in the open plan in ways that sort of dismissed workers' desires for prior privacy in a fundamental way. Um, I look at personalization and sort of the, the efforts uh, to sort of think about what the role of the user is in creating their own work environment and how much control they should have over their workspace and sort of what some of the tensions were in, in, in operationalizing the ideal of easy flexibility for workers and, and of course, somewhat restrictive um, corporate policy sometimes that evolved around, around personal decoration and personal, personal change of your space. I look at technology issues um, and how the what happened when the computer arrived and how that too sort of um, created new challenges in relation to the design and use of, of the open plan and and how that transformed basically the open plan itself and, and especially systems furniture from you know, simple um, partitions into, you know, a power grid basically for the office and then how that in turn created um, a whole nother set of problems. And then um, the last thing is I, I look at the problem of movement um, and how movement was conceptualized as a tool of the open plan and ideal of the open plan and all the inequities that are embedded in who gets to move and how movement is structured and understood um, uh, as part of as part of what the open plan is. Um, so that's kind of the, the kind of at least the some of the thematic thematic issues um, that I that I look at um, and all of this is here to to, to sort of um, help understand uh, this this tension um, really that emerges between the those ideals and and their and their lived their lived reality of these open plan offices that were prop, cropping up all over the United States across all different industries and all different kinds of um, work environments. 
Uh, before we uh, delve deeper into the text, I, I have to ask, since I think there's something interesting in this for anybody who's worked in an office since the middle part of the last century, uh, what drew you to your research topic to research this? Yeah. Oh, so um, that that's a really good question. Um, before I, so this was my PhD research. Um, so I, I, I was working on this for a long time, but, but um, the reason I started working on it in the first place is that um, I had between my master's program and my PhD, I spent about a year and change working at um, Knoll, which is an office furniture manufacturer um, that you make systems furniture. And so I was working for, for a short time for Knoll, uh, actually in the Minneapolis showroom. And it was a very strange experience. Um, I, there were a lot of things I really enjoyed about that, but I was really, um, I realized at that moment that I, at the time I thought I knew what a cubicle was. Um, and it wasn't until I worked for Knoll that I understood, that I realized I had no idea what a cubicle actually was until I, I got to encounter it through the, the lens of the furniture manufacturers and, and all of the complexity of those systems and all the strangeness of them. And I, I um, was just really, really, um, I, I thought they were really odd. And I'm spending all this time both working in a cubicle and selling cubicles. And I thought, you know, this, these things are just weird. Um, and, and then I found out, of course, that um, they had been meant as this very progressive idea. And that just really surprised me because in my mind, I had watched the movie Office Space. and I had this very negative perception of what a cubicle was. Um, and I, I really wanted to understand that tension between how I had encountered them and how so many people encounter the, the, the cubicle and what what, what those intentions had been. Um, so that, that was exactly the question that really got me started. So of the, uh, the themes that you break down for your book, is there one that to you stands out? Like, would you say this is the big, this is the main one, or are they all co-equal? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, I think they are mostly, mostly they are co-equal, but I actually think if, if I had to pick one, I would probably be change um, because I think it actually underpins all of them, right? The, the change was the, the sort of underlying goal. They were going to change all of these things. Um, and they truly believed the architects and designers and the organizations, the early adopters of the open plan really saw the open plan as a means of enacting change, um, you know, organizational change, spatial change, technological change, cultural change, economic change. <laughs> um, they really, they really saw the, the the space of the office as a means of, you know, really transforming the way work might happen um, and the kind of work that might happen. Um, and it, it it's really um, was, of course, at this very important moment um, in the 1960s and 1970s when there were some fairly large changes underway in terms of management theory. Um, so a real shift from a very top down, a belief that the, the sort of tradition of the, the post war, so when we think of the post war organization as a very kind of top down bureaucracy, um, you know, an army of, of um, men in, in gray flannel suits, right, um, showing up <laughs> at the office, um, and this desire to to um, disrupt that, to undo that um, uh, by way of, of new ideas of management that were around ideas of, you know, sort of greater autonomy and independence, um, you know. The work of, of course, Douglas McGregor and Peter Drucker, who sort of imagined this oncoming sort of transformation of the organization um, around this new figure of, um, of the knowledge worker in the case of, of Drucker, right, this, this new class of worker who needed a very different kind of work environment. And, and in fact, it's that worker, the knowledge worker, that really was at the heart of the open plan too. Um, and at the at least the way that it was imagined by its, its most vocal proponents who saw this as a way of upending the kind of state bureaucracy um, that they saw as being harmful not only to workers, but frankly, to the organization as a whole, because these organizations would then become stagnant, they would become out of date. Um, and the only way to sort of really keep up would be to, to sort of adopt these, these, new, these new kind of um, management ideas. And so the, the, this kind of interplay of these um, kind of philosophies around management and this kind of changing, these changing um, kind of ideals um, sort of really interface with um, with the open plan as a tool for achieving that, right? So if you were if you were a progressive manager, you wanted the open plan because you thought the open plan would help you enact this very, you know, developmental sort of um, autonomous worker and ideal that you were hoping to hoping to uh, make manifest. Did it? <laughs> no. <laughs> 
um, unfortunately, uh, no. But but you know, it does say a lot, right? To the ways that um, I think, and this is a recurring theme in my book as well. The way that you know the office was often seen as a magical solution to problems, right? If you just fix the office everything else will fall into place. Everything else will be okay. And, um, and, and it would, it would um, not only reflect these ideals of change, but really make those change, changes possible. And of course, that was a complete overreach of what, what office design can do. Um, office is not nearly, can't, can't fix problems uh, <laughs> that are quite so grand. Um, and so I think, I think there was a, a lot of it was a, um, maybe an, an overselling of <laughs> the possibilities of space for, uh, for changing the way that people inhabit or interact. Um, although I don't, I don't think that the, the, the failure of it and to manifest that kind of change doesn't mean that, that it isn't worth looking at how they were imagining that or thinking about it. Um, uh, in some ways, the failure itself is quite interesting, right? To look at all the ways in which this didn't quite live up to, to those expectations. Um, but, but also it's interesting, uh, at least I always think it's interesting how often workers, especially early on, also saw a lot of potential in the open plan. Like you do see a lot of workers sort of talking about the open plan as a solution to problems as well. So, so there are some interesting places where um, I think there is a lot of um, a lot of hope expressed around around a transformation of the workplace uh, that that never quite happens. <laughs> right. Actually, that is. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about how to phrase because that is. Uh, related to something that I like literally saw in the photographs that you chose to use in your book is that the off the open office spaces from the 60s especially those looked really I thought at least you know to my sensibilities I thought those looked really nice and inviting and like well if that's what an open office looks like sign me up and <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I was struck by that too. Um, like the early, I mean, I actually really love the, the look of um, the, the 60s and early 70s open plans and they're, they're very colorful and there's a, there's a sort of, um, they're not as built up as the later ones are. And this partially has to do um, with the change in the kind of um, physical um, details, the kind of materiality of systems furniture, um, which maybe is worth uh, talking about a little bit. So, so the open plan, uh, the early open plan was really a manifestation or a, a sort of outgrowth, the American open plan of two different um, new ideas in office planning that emerged around the same time in the 1960s. One was something called office landscape, which was a German office planning concept um, that um, imagined um, that used patterns of communication as a way of kind of organizing workers freely in a large open unpartitioned space using very minimal furniture. So just simple tables and chairs and these um, light curving screens that were very movable. And so it's a very, very simple kind of office interior in terms of its setup. Um, but the idea was to really center communication. And then the other sort of important thread is this idea of systems furniture, uh, which was a kind of new uh, office furniture concept that really, um, really came out of um, a company called Herman Miller that had developed this new, um, this new system that they called Action Office. Um, and it was a modular furniture system with um, partitions that um, supported work surfaces and storage elements um, that could be sort of hung in space and creating um, a workstation around the worker. Um, this kind of way, really it's what we think of as a cubicle basically. So it's these, these components that can get assembled into all these different configurations. And these two, two threads together kind of came to be what, what was known in America as the American open plan office. Um, and so early on, the early systems furniture lines like Action Office were these really lightweight, very flexible, very adaptable um, furniture. In fact, Action Office was so easy to change that, you know, use, workers themselves were going to be able to change their workspace. At least that was the theory. Um, they even, Herman Miller even recommended that companies adopting Action Office keep some um, extra furniture pieces in their stock room, like right next to the company stationery and your boxes of pencils, there would be like a stack of partitions and extra storage elements that you could just grab and add to your, add to your workstation as you needed them. So there's this real idea under this of a very flexible, adaptable space, adaptable to the organization, but also adaptable to the work worker in a way that was really novel and really interesting and quite different from the, the sort of very fixed, you know, sort of heavy desks of the post-war era, right? they were they were these kind of lightweight very flexible um, elements 
But what happens is that over the course of the 80s, as computers start to come in, and I kind of mentioned this, the technology starts to transform the physical uh, form factor of these of these office partitions. And in particular, they they get all of this um, wiring at the base um, that facilitates the expansion expansion of the electrical and the communication networks of the office um, to support mostly to support computers. And as a result, all of it becomes more fixed, all of it becomes more heavy, all of it becomes very you know, um, you know, in institutional looking um, in a way that really um, works against, I think, that sort of vibrant dynamic vision that you see in those 60s images, because those 60s images really embody the kind of enthusiasm and excitement and the kind of almost a scrappy quality <laughs> to the 1960s office that I think is, is um, I, I agree with you. I find it kind of um, compelling, interesting. Um, and, and, it's, and then you see the ones in the 80s, the high tech office, right? Which is everything goes gray in the 1980s. And, 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 and I think that's, that is mostly what is in our head of what the open plan is, is those gray, gray and beige cubicles um, with a, you know, like you see in, in office space, <laughs> which, um, which I think did, and did become the dominant, the dominant office design um, for, you know, two decades at least. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I'm kind of curious. Um, I know that this is a very like specific niche question. Why was there the push to put uh, the infrastructure for the power of the cables and the communications inside the partitions i'm just thinking like specifically uh when i used to have an upstairs office at hagley i would go past a photograph of an old uh bullpen style office mm -hmm. and all of those power cables for like the electric typewriters come down from the ceiling so was yeah. there a, a push to to eliminate sort of the the ceiling network <laughs> so to speak? Yes, yeah, so there's different there's different models. So, so this is really interesting. Um, yeah, so I mean, you're absolutely right. So how power enters the, the interior envelope of the office um, work differently in different kinds of structures, uh, depending on when the building was built and you know what what methods they used at the time. So absolutely, you see some that were overhead, you see some that are built into the floor, you see some that are on columns. <laughs> so there's a lot of different places where, where power was allocated in the space. One of the problems, and I think this is this is one of the really interesting issues that I, I was very interested in, is the kind of um, temporal um, uh, mismatch, if you will, between when when open plan started to come in and when computers started to come in um, meant that the early open plans were really underpowered. Um, they didn't put enough power in because they didn't ever imagine that computers were gonna be at every workstation. Um, at the time, most of the electrical equipment were in secretarial areas, right, with the electric typewriter and dictaphones and things of that sort. Um, and, you know, your average worker who was a, you know, white collar professional worker, they might just have a lamp on their desk <laughs> And maybe a calculator, not much else that needed to be plugged in. So they never imagined the kind of power demands um, that that when the when personal computers entered really kind of required. And this is also because, of course, at the time, computers were these large room sized things mm -hmm. that existed in specially built spaces that had, of course, huge power requirements, but they were built in in a very different way from from how we think of the personal computer. So one of the things that the cubicle increasingly had to do, what systems furniture had to do was to extend the power of the building um, that had never been designed around the expectation of so many computers in the space um, to, to make it possible to use computers. And, and one of the ways in which they do that is that the, the, um, the furniture system itself also gets, becomes, gets circuits and things. Like it really becomes a very, a very sophisticated extension of the building um, that needs to manage the power across multiple workstations um, to ensure that they, all, the, all of the equipment can operate. And of course, when you're working on a computer, unlike a typewriter, where if there's a little glitch in your power, like what you've just written on the piece of paper that you're typing on, <laughs> theoretically, is still there. If you're working on a computer and you suddenly have a power outage and you're computer goes out, you have lost everything. So, so power, the stability of power, the access to power becomes really, really important. Um, and of course, at the time when it, you had a computer, it wasn't just your CPU, it was, it was also your, your monitor, it might be a printer, it might be, you know, there's a whole host of other objects that also needed to be plugged in. And so, um, so there really is this sort of, um, you know, enormous, enormous um, uh, problem in managing all of that, um, all of that power. Um, and, and so the cubicle really kind 
kind of um, evolved to address what was actually an architectural problem, not enough power in the first place <laughs> to, to, um, to make, to make, to make computers suitable to the workspace. So they were really kind of, um, you know, systems furniture and the cubicle was really serving um, this, this role of, of kind of adapting the architecture to the technology, um, as well as, and I think equally importantly, adapting the technology to the human um, by way of ergonomics. So there's some really interesting places where I think the cubicle becomes this, this tool that helps facilitate uh, the expansion of the, of, the, um, of the personal computer in the office. Uh, maybe we're getting a little too recent, but is there pushback from the systems furniture manufacturers of we don't need to do this anymore? You know, a laptop is very lightweight in comparison to what it needs in terms of power. And, you know, goodness knows if you even need to bother with something like a printer at all anymore. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. In our modern day, our modern day um, computers, which are, you know, you don't need, um, it's not even just the power. I mean, of course, one of the other things was um, communication cables, right? So be able to hook up to networks and things of that sort. And of course, now we have wireless connectivity um, that is is standard um, all over. And so, um, so absolutely, you're right. Like the modern day, modern day cubicles tend not to have nearly as much um, of that um, of that of that connectivity, um, or if they do, it's sort of an out, outdated <laughs> element of that. Um, and you can see that actually in a lot of you know modern open plans where actually the walls have pretty much disappeared entirely, right? So we've gotten to a place where if you look at at the the new open plans, they are completely open. There are no more partitions, and that's in part a reflection actually of how little how little um, uh, you know we need the. The, the, the long runs of cabling that used to be the sort of, um, you know, underpinning of so many of these, so many of these systems lines. Um, so that, that actually is a really big shift, um, I think, in, in how furniture manufacturers are thinking about what kinds of technology the, the furniture needs to support and how that technology gets encoded or the assumptions of that technology get encoded into the form factor and into the structure and design of the furniture. All right. So we've been talking a lot about uh technology and its impacts on this design. How about uh, the human body and its relationships to these designs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am really, I am really interested in, in the, the humanness of people, right? I'm really interested in that, that interface of the body with the, the physical environment of the office. Um, and I think about that both in terms of, you know, things like the cubicle itself, sort of how tall are people? Um, what is privacy? What is the optimum height for privacy? If is somebody who is, you know, five foot two, like I am, do they, do I have a different need for privacy than my husband who is a full foot taller than I am, right? So how does that, how does things like height um, uh, change sort of what our expectations of like visual privacy are? Um, but also of course, things like, um, and perhaps more intimate part of the body, I think when we're talking about office furniture or chairs um, and the way that chairs become this, this, this really kind of human interface, um, if you will, of, of the, the worker to the workspace. Um, and I've been really interested in chairs uh, for a while I've, I've, as a kind of an offshoot of this project. I'd done some work on the history of, of ergonomic office chairs and, um, and especially the, the sort of problem of the secretarial chair versus the executive chair and, and how sort of gendered bodies are, are kind of built into, into different kinds of office furniture. Um, and that was often tied to um, differences of size. So women were often assumed to be, they're going to inevitably be smaller. And so, um, you know, women's, uh, women's secretarial chairs tended to be lighter and smaller in dimensions, while executive chairs tended to be larger um, in every way, right? They were wider, they were deeper, they were taller. Um, uh, you you know, kind of really encoding in this way gendered bodies into the space. But one of the things that I've always been interested in in relation to this is the way that too is a an artifact of um, assuming a kind of normate body, an average body um, that is in many ways exclusionary to anybody whose body doesn't fit with the assumptions of who's going to be sitting in that chair. Um, and you get all these mismatches of people who are then who find themselves sitting in a chair that isn't it wasn't built for their body, it wasn't meant for a body like theirs. Um, and these kinds of tensions emerge in a lot of ways. You get people who, who literally cannot fit in say a small secretarial chair um, or, um, or literally can't fit in a large executive chair. Right? It's, it's um, these kind of mismatches of the body and the, and the furniture are really, um, I think part of the, the intimacy of these, of these pieces, right? Because that's how we, we as humans, as people um, with, with individualized bodies 
bodies kind of encounter a lot of this furniture and experience those tensions in real time um, as we as we sort of have to adjust to these to these awkward um, awkward relationships. And actually, one of my favorite examples of this is not a chair, but actually is typing height. So you may you may have noticed that, um, or in your own experience, that um, you know the average desk is um, at a certain height that is is you know it's kind of normalized. Like we have what is what we think of as standard desk height, um, uh, but but um, typing height has always been a lower lower height, which is one of the reasons why we have things like keyboard trays and keyboard drawers. The idea is that you should be typing usually at a lower height than where your desk is. Um, so the keyboard, the, the kind of lowered keyboard is kind of um, a, an ideal of, of typing. Um, but the, the, the standard typing desk of the, the 1960s, the standard typing height was based on a woman's body because it was assumed that a woman would be doing the typing. So for a lot of men, if you find yourself sitting at an old at an old um, secretarial style desk that has a regular height main surface and a lowered height typing surface that lower height typing surface is probably far too low for a lot of people um, because it because it is based around the assumption of a, of a fairly smaller petite woman usually um, so so really interesting ways in which these things get carried in and then you see those assumptions getting kind of picked up even by furniture or, or computer makers who start looking at the form factor of the secretarial typing desk and encode the 26 inch height desk into many of their designs or kind of assuming a 26 inch height desk, which of course is actually something that was suitable for mostly women and not for men. And anyway, there's, there's all these interesting places where the, again, these assumptions get sort of built in um, and ways that frankly become very exclusionary because um, they not only in, in, encode who they think will be there, but they exclude who they think will not be there, um, right? So there's all these, um, I think, interesting ways in which these assumptions um, sort of manifest. Uh, and again, are experienced in real in real times in the form of a desk that's too low to type on comfortably or a chair that isn't the right size for your body um, that that you're sort of stuck with because this is what was assigned to you. And so I always find that type of discussion very interesting on a personal level at, at six and a half feet tall as I'm reading your descriptions of the secretarial desk or the secretarial chair versus the executive chair and I'm thinking to myself I wouldn't necessarily fit in either of those. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. They're so they really have a whole set of, of, of norms. And a lot of this actually, I, I'm sure um, you may you may be familiar with that with this, but the way that um, um, human factors worked in in you know kind of um, industrial design is that um, there were this this set of measurements. Um, and, and these were actually um, kind of really uh, I won't say pioneered, but but um, promoted by uh, by Henry Dreyfus, the designer Henry Dreyfus, who created this these series of drawings um, that were known as Joe and Josephine. They were these standard human figures um, that represented sort of an average male and an average female um, body, and and they they came with a series of sort of um, dimensions on like every dimension possible right of the human body um but they but what they ended up doing and they, these got published and they were used extensively by industrial designers across across the country and actually i think across the world i mean they're really widely adopted um these these standards they sort of got encoded into a lot of um a lot of furniture a lot of the a lot of designed things um and, and what's interesting about them is the way that they did absolutely sort of encode the assumptions of mid-20th century sexism basically into, <laughs> into spaces um so that so that such decisions get made so not only do they they sort of normalize um you know a, a sort of average body an average male body and an average female body as the the sort of center to which we should design to in many ways. Um, they also end up um, kind of reifying the assumptions about who does what um, and, and kind, of, um, kind of reinforcing that expectation. And you, there is some really good research, for example, on how um, you know, military fighter jets were built around a male body, making it hard for women pilots to operate them because they're physically, they weren't adjustable in a way that made it even possible in some cases for women to, who were smaller in stature to be able to even fit in the space. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's some really interesting, I think some really, really interesting issues here that, that um, point to, I think, the way that um, design can be very exclusionary in unexpected, 
in unexpected ways. And that kind of exclusionary aspect kind of um, manifests in, in sort of these very ordinary interactions of people and the, the, the spaces and things that, they, that they're using every day. And how did this reflect on disabled people in the workplace too? Yeah, absolutely. Such a good question. Um, the yes, the open plan and and you know a lot of these spaces are deeply ableist, um, if you will. They they really they really emphasize um, ability as a as a kind of um, set of minimum minimal um, uh, expectations of use, right? Um, as there's a lot of ways in which being able to stand is expected, um, seeing is expected, a sort of normative notion of hearing is expected. Um, and anybody who, who's, whose ability falls outside of what is considered normal is going to struggle in, to some extent in these spaces. I think about one of, the, one of the huge problems I think of a lot in the open plan in particular is noise, right? Open plans are noisy, they are loud. Um, and depending on how they were designed, they, are, they can be, um, there are a lot of ways in which they could manage acoustics, but in general, they tend to be very, very poor spaces for, for people, even with normative hearing. Um, imagine how hard that would be for someone who is deaf um, and how, how, you know, the sounds of that space. Um, and here I'm thinking about people who are, who maybe are deaf, but still have some hearing, um, who, you know, might have even more trouble in this space that has so little, um, so little uh, acoustic protection. Um, or I think about, um, you know, the way that, you um, uh, seeing is really privileged in the open plan. This idea of the ease of looking over and seeing as, as part of the kind of basic functioning of an open plan design that you should be able to sort of easily make contact with people in a visual fashion is again, another kind of very ableist element. Although one of the interesting things about the open plan, one of the the potentially um, inclusive elements of it, um, I think, and this is this is something that I thought was really interesting. Some disabled activists thought that the open plan, because of its flexibility, because you could have the workstation, the work surface height at, at any height, um, especially in like action office, where you really could go from standing height to sitting height and anywhere in between, um, really allowing for, for um, a, a very adaptive space that could quickly be adjusted to suit the needs of, of, the, of a disabled user. So there are a lot of ways in which, in concept, the open plan and certainly systems furniture could have been a very um, inclusive um, potential, a potentially conclusive concept. Um, but I think the way that it was often um, implemented didn't didn't necessarily um, achieve that goal. And I think one of the places we also see this is that in the 1990s, uh, uh, after the passage of ADA, a lot of companies then had to sort of start thinking about, well, how do we adjust our offices to better accommodate this new law? And what does what does this mean for us? Um, and I think the open plan really had um, created, on the one hand, it made certain things easier because they could make some pretty quick adjustments to sort of, for example, um, in an open plan design, you can pretty easily adjust the width of a, of, a, of a walkway, right? Because they're modular partitions that can just be moved. So that part, that part was pretty easy. Um, but all the built elements of the office were not so easy to change. Um, and, you know, where the, the bathroom stalls, right, um, are much harder to change. Um, the um, height of the um, water fountain is you know, things like things of that sort. And so you would see some really interesting um, questions come up, I think, um, with the passage of the ADA that, that really, I think, illustrate, I think, some of the failures, um, actually, of the open plan, um, and kind of highlight some of these very tensions um, that were that were kind of under the under the hood of, of who was expected to use the open plan. Um, and, and um, I do think that's that to me is one of the, the really interesting questions. Did the arrival of the suburban office park have any big impacts on the open plan? Yes, I mean certainly the the you know um, you know as as there there's been some you know some great work actually on of course the history of those kind of suburban suburban offices um, that really predate the open plan uh, right the uh, at least predate the, the open plan I'm talking about so so the, you know the the post war office a lot of those were these kind of suburban um, suburban um, offices um, but you do what one of the things that I think um, I didn't actually write as much about in my book but I think is really interesting is the the open plan. Um, and systems furniture intersects with a, a new trend towards um, leasing office space instead of building your own office space. And so you see a lot of companies of all different sizes from, you know, large, large major corporations to, you know, you know, uh, public company, uh, 
organizations, um, you know, sort of state government and so on, leasing office space rather than building it. Um, and, and a lot of those were out in suburban areas. Um, and so you get these empty buildings that have just a flat footprint. There's no walls, there's no partitions. And the idea is you're just gonna bring in your systems furniture and set up your open plan. Um, and so it actually does have this really kind of interesting um, sort of, uh, I think it facilitates that. It makes that easier to do or kind of leads to that becoming the new norm, um, especially in the 1990s where you got these kind of really, really, well, we've all seen them, I'm sure, those those rows of like low, very um, kind of, they all look the same. <laughs> Our office parks that you see out in, in, in the exurbs, they're not even suburbs, they're like the exurb, the exurb office building. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Texas. There were a lot of those in Texas. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> so let's bring the conversation back around to Hagley, because I know you've had uh, a, at least a couple of research visits. I, I remember interviewing you for the uh, predecessor of this program on one of those visits. Um, what sort of things were you able to find at Hagley that went to support your research? Yeah. Oh my gosh. The Hagley is a magical place. I'll just say it. I, it is, it is such a magical place. Um, so for me um, and for my research, and I, I did make two visits. So I spent about a total of about three weeks at the Hagley, uh, which were um, just absolutely amazing um, to do. Um, but the focus of most of my research uh, was trade catalogs. Um, I was really interested in Hagley. Hagley has a really, really rich collection of um, especially furniture manufacturers, trade catalogs from all different furniture manufacturers. And that's one of the things that I was really excited about um, and and um, uh, put, uh, you know, was really, you know, both in the, the, the main library and then also in the Soda House, looking at um, it, it, these different different um, trade calcs across all different different types of office furniture manufacturers. And for me, what was really neat about the Hagley's collection is its idiosyncrasy, um, because there are other um, collections where you could see perhaps a complete run of Herman Miller's um, uh, marketing materials, for example. But the Hagley's collection includes a lot of very unusual and surprising um, uh, different different types of office furniture makers from the, the big names, the Herman Millers and the Knowles and the Hayworths to the this lesser known ones, the Kimballs, the Krugers. Um, and so, so I was able to sort of really look more expansively. And that was one of the things I really wanted to do in my book is not just tell the story of the big names. I, it wasn't just a steel case Herman Miller Knoll book, right? I wanted to look beyond the big big three, <laughs> as you might think of them as, um, to, see, to see all the different kinds of kinds of furniture being made and the ways that different furniture manufacturers, even kind of on the lower lower end of the market, we're, we're thinking about some of these issues and, and marketing to them, talking about them and dealing with them. The other really neat piece of this, and, and this is, I think, one of the other cool things, is that um, among the Hagley's um, you know, great re uh, literature is that it's not just the, the glossy brochure that was there to sell the idea of the open plan to its clients, to architects, to designers, to organizations. There were also the um, assembly guides, the instruction kits, the price lists, um, and these two for me were absolutely just priceless because the they really allowed me to look much close much more closely at the some of the uh, material slippages between the way that they were describing the furniture in the, the glossy brochure and when you actually look at how it's assembled, the complexity of it, where those ideas kind of fall apart. They're like, oh, it's so easy to assemble. And then you look at the assembly lid. It's like your Ikea, it's like your Ikea furniture, right? You go to Ikea and they're like, it's so easy. And then you open it up and you get this booklet and you're like, oh crap. Like, <laughs> what have I just gotten myself into? And imagine that for a room full of office furniture, right? <laughs> That's basically how it was. And so I was, I, for me, that was a really interesting thing. And I really um, enjoyed being able to sort of, sort of um, see, see close up those, those kinds of, um, you know, the fine print, if you will, the, the tension between the, that glossy brochure and the fine print of the, of the technical a, um, aspects of the, of the, of the furniture. Um, so that was really the, the main, the main focus for me. Um, I will say, I also did look at some, um, the, the, some of the papers of some of the designers, um, especially in Soda House. So, um, you know, um, uh, William Palman's uh, collection, for example. So, um, so there were some really, really great little, um, you know, sort of unexpected, um, finds at uh, it, it, it every turn, um, it, which is which is of course what's magical about archival research always. 
Yes, the Pullman papers are extensive and popular. <laughs> With good reason. And oh my gosh, uh, you know, I, I I actually, the cover of my book comes from a, a catalog that was in, in the Pullman collection. That was, <laughs> I was sitting there at Soda House um, and I opened up a, a, a folder and that was the cover of a, of a, um, of a trade catalog and my heart stopped. <laughs> I said, oh my God, that's my cover. <laughs> that has to be my cover. <laughs> nice. I'm glad you were able to get it. Yeah. Um, so what sort of takeaways do you want folks to get from your work? Yeah, this is a really good question. I think, you know, for me, one of the things I think really um, continues to motivate my interest in this subject is that the open plan continues to be presented as a new concept. And I, I am struck by this. It happens again and again and again. Like you get these new iterations through like this new new open plan, you know, whether it's the cubicle um, or the open, open plan where there's no walls, right? <laughs> um, at every turn, we see this, this idea of the open plan kind of getting recycled. And I was really curious, like, what is it, what is it about the open plan that makes it so compelling? That makes it something that seems so useful, so intriguing, so, you know, sort of universally applicable. And, um, and, and I was really, I've really been interested in, in that problem of, of that kind of recycling, you know, what, why is it? And I think part of it is that we've often failed to learn from the mistakes of the past. I think part of it is that we kind of end up recycling these same ideals over and over again. And I, I talk about how, you know, um, you know, the more recent, in recent years, you see some of the same language that was used to describe the early open plan being used to describe, you know, the offices at Facebook, you know, <laughs> um, and that, 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 that we just kind of keep recycling these same, these same ideals without really thinking about who they, whose, whose needs they actually facilitate and who they actually harm or are not, are a disservice to. And so part of the thing I, I, I hope that, that um, you know, uh, our, at least architects and designers might take away is asking these questions and thinking a little more, you know, critically perhaps about what it is they're really trying to do and um, how, they're, how they're thinking about what space is and who space serves. I mean, I think there's, there's also a lot of um, inequities and I was really interested too in this piece, like how the, the expectations of those in positions of power often end up causing differential sort of um, harm on people in lower positions, on, on more vulnerable positions, people whose bodies and whose needs are not seen as, as important or as worth considering as those in, in, in higher level positions. And so, um, so I'm really interested in, in getting, getting um, designers and architects too to think about that in a, in a more nuanced way. Um, and then I hope too for, for, for others, this will give people a way of thinking about how we got to this point. Um, I think I often get people wanting to know, well, why, why did the open plan happen? They're terrible, right? Don't you think they're terrible? <laughs> And I say, yes, yes, let's talk about why they're terrible. Um, everybody has a story. Everyone has a story <laughs> about why the open plan is uniquely terrible to them. Um, and I think, I think that deserves to be told. And I think one of the reasons this has often not gotten told as much is that too often in, especially in architectural history, there's been this tr a tradition or a focus of staying on what the ideals were and not what the impact was. And so one of the things I also wanted to do was to say, look, we need to look beyond that first installation to understand the life of a space, all of the people who are using that space, not just the target user, not just the idealized user, not just the imagined user, but the actual user. <laughs> and hopefully that will get us thinking a little bit more complexly about what these spaces meant and who they served and who they ultimately harmed. Right. And I'm wondering if by way of uh, a final topic, if we could talk about sort of the elephant in the room as far as office work at present goes, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, a thing happened and there was a, a revolution of sorts in terms of where office work takes place and how it happens. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the elephant in the room. Um, and in fact, I get one little tiny mention of COVID in my book. I don't know if you caught it. The very conclusion. And that was because I was literally doing the final edits, the final, final edits to submit in March 2020. <laughs> That is when I was doing the final, final, final edits um, before, before the, you know, for it going off to, to be, um, you know, 
copy edited and all that stuff. And I, I was like, oh crap, this is going to change everything. But of course in March, 2020, it still was not clear what was going to happen. And I think it still, it still is not clear in <laughs> March, 2022. Um, you know, we're still, I think we're still sort of late waiting for the chips to fully fall. I think one of the interesting things has been um, in, into my mind is the, 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 you know, of course, of course, this push to working from home and that kind of um, increasing number of people who have been able to work from home um, through a lot of the pandemic. Um, and that, that has really, um, I think, shifted the expectations about what people want. There actually is a, a historical precedent to this moment. Um, and, and I do think there are some interesting lessons to be learned, especially from what are known as the alternative offices of the 1990s, when there was a similar kind of idea that telecommuting was going to upend the way that we did our work. And there were all these offices actually built through the 1990s that were banking on a future in which telecommuting was going to be the new norm, in which most people were not coming to work every, um, at least not you know, knowledge workers. <laughs> we can, we can uh, complicate who most workers actually is. But um, the idea was that, that a whole class of workers was no longer going to be coming to an office anymore. And so what kind of office footprint did that mean? And we did see this kind of shrinking, actually, of office space that kind of happened in the 1990s um, because there was no longer an expectation that every worker would have a workspace. But instead, there were, this was kind of the growth of hot desking and, and sort of you know, non-territorial offices where you sort of show up and they say, oh, yeah, you're, you can sit over there today. That one's open. Or, oh, we have an office down the hall you could use for today, that kind of thing. Um, and so I think we're actually seeing right now a sort of um, resurgence of that of that thinking, even as many companies are currently talking about a uh, return to the office. I just saw, I think it was just yesterday, that Google announced a return, officially marking a return as of April of all their work workers to the office. I think it was cool. Um, anyways, so you're seeing a lot of companies that have been like, oh yeah, we'll work for home, at least for the time being, maybe forever. And now they're already kind of, no, maybe not forever because we actually want you to come back to our pretty offices that we built. And, you know, we, we want you to be physically present again. Um, and I am not surprised at all by that because I think one of the reasons the office continues to be um, fetishized uh, and I do think fetishized is the right word, um, is that there's this idea, again, that there, there's something magical about getting people in a room together, that something happens when people are physically in space together. Um, and it, it is, it is a, a fantasy, if you will. I don't know that it, it I don't know that it is as transformative as we sometimes imagine it is, but it is a very compelling in image. And I think, um, you know, it's one of the reasons that that kind of keeps keeps coming back. And so I think you're going to see a lot of other companies saying there was something very special about being physically in, in place together. And we need that again. And, and so I think we're going to see this kind of um, more and more companies kind of slowly sort of pivoting their their language of work from home to sort of three days a week, three three in, two out, or two in and three out, that kind of thing, where workers are going to be, going to be kind of maybe balancing it out to, to um, um, you know, at least for maybe for some, some time. Um, but I do think workers, and, and I think we were talking about this too, like, workers can make some choices. Um, and there are some places where I think workers are making some choices about where they want to work, where they have a choice. And if they have a choice between having to go to an office and being able to have flexibility, flexibility of working from home, we may see some workers maybe really pushing to retain the right to work from home if they want it. Um, now that's not to say everybody wants to work from home. Some people are going to be very eager to get back to the office um, for all kinds of reasons, right? Uh, working in the space with your five-year-old child is not awesome <laughs> for many of us <laughs> who had to do that. Um, I, I so I think I think there again we this is another example where even who we think these systems serve the best sometimes on the flip side create harms that we we can't always anticipate. So yeah, I think this is a really this is a really interesting interesting moment. And I think we're all. I mean, I know as a historian, I'm watching, um, you know, fa I'm fascinated, right, to watch how this how this kind of process unfolds and, and the sort of um, two steps forward, one step back, or is it one step forward, two steps back? I don't know. I never know how that goes. But anyway, uh, that idea that we're kind of kind of slowly opening up and then closing up again and opening up again. And, and at every turn, I feel like we're the companies are kind of revealing their their priorities, right, of what it is they really want, um, whenever whenever the opening up starts to happen. I look forward to the next book. It's going to be all about that, right? <laughs> right. There you go. There you go. There. I've just, I've just written my next book uh, proposal, right? There it is. <laughs> well, say so we are at our time. Uh, thank you for sitting down with me to talk about your 
latest book, uh, Open Plan, A Design History of the American Office. And that's another episode of Hagley History Hangout. Uh, see us again in two weeks for the next one. Uh.